Amos Fortune, free man. Africa, 1725. Night came down swiftly over the equatorial forest. There was no lingering of daylight, but after the snuffling out of the sun, darkness and the bright appearing of stars. No silence came with the darkness for this was a night alive with song and movement. In the village of the Atmunchi, the people were gathering for their mystic dance that would welcome in the time of herbage, the time for the planting of corn. Into the center of the clearing, surrounded by small conical huts that was a village, a wooden drum had been brought. With solemn reverence, Sala, the old wise man of the tribe, approached and began beating it. It was not long, the only sound in the darkness. Soon smaller drums in the distant parts of the clearing took up beating. Then wooden flutes joined in from the outskirts of the village. Their sound was muted at first, but it grew sharper and higher as the men blowing the flutes came nearer. Joined by the beaters on the drums, the sound quickened in pace and fervor as all gathered in a group around the great drum coming into time with Sala's rhythmic beating. The moon rose high enough for the light to filter through the heavy foliage. It gleamed on the black bodies of the men, on the faces of the women and children who had been gathering in the clearing, summoned by the music and swaying with it like a field of tall grass before the wind. When the flutes and drums ceased, all the Munchi turned and faced the same way, making obeisance to their chief who sat on a raised platform at one end of the clearing, the moon full on him and his children standing beside him. Atmon, the young prince, was tall and powerfully built, though he had seen no more than fifteen summers. He carried his head high and his eyes flashed. Atmon, the twelve-year-old princess, smiled shyly at her tribe's people, then turned to whisper to her father's ear. She leaned against him, hoping to hide the deformed leg that, but for her father's love, would have caused her to have been drowned as an infant. Only the sacrifice of the imperfect to the God of life could assure protection for the perfect. But the chief had gone against his tribal code and sacrificed his favorite dog to keep his infant daughter, and thus far the God of life had wreaked no vengeance on him. The Atmunchi were as pagan as all the tribes in Africa, but they were peaceable, and they were as well intense in their love of freedom. The chief acknowledged the obeisance of his people and spread his hands before them, palms down, indicating that they might do their own pleasure for the next space of time. The people stood quietly while more and more of the Atmunchi came in from the jungle to join the group in the clearing. At the outskirts of the village, beyond the circle of conical huts, they laid down their knives and spears. The weapons, lying in their piles without men to hold them, gave back the moonlight sheen in harmless splendor. This was a night of peace, and during it no and Bunchi could bear anything symbolic of killing. This was the time when the earth was reborn. Sala commenced beating the great drum again, and all the smaller drums followed but in such unison that it was like single reverberations on the night. Then flutes picked up the sound. The dancers gathered themselves together, twelve men well matched in size. Slowly they made their way around the open space in the clearing, shoulders, hips, feet, translating the sounds of flutes and drums into movement. The music quickened, steps grew longer, and guttural voices uttered the incantation which had been said by their fathers and would be said by their children. Earth our mother, sun our father, watch while we plant, moon our sister, rain our brother, aid the seeds to bear fruit, that the harvest may be good enough for us and our children. Over and over the words were repeated as family after family of the Etmunshi joined in until the forest beyond the clearing echoed and re-echoed the chant. Then, at a signal from the chief, the chanting ceased and the dancers fell back, leaving an open space in their midst. 
Atmon bowed to his father and with a series of leaps covered the distance from the raised platform at one end of the clearing to the open space. There he stood in his full height, lifting his hands, palms up to the sky. Then swiftly he knelt, palms down to the earth, bowing his head and pressing his lips to the soil, all that he had, all that he ever would be, he gave to his people. He was their prince, someday to be their chief. He could not do otherwise. Rising, he bounded back to the platform and knelt before his sister. Taking her in his arms, frail and slight of body as she was, he danced with her before the people. He is strong, they said to each other, voices hushed like the wind through the bamboo. He is beautiful, they said, smiling to each other, like the first light of dawn. When the time comes, he will rule us well, said Salah, who had seen many rulers. An old woman tapped her head. Not with this will he rule, she said, but so. And she laid her hand upon her heart. See how he is with his sister? Atmon danced on, swirling his light burden above the heads of the people, then swinging her low. Always Athman smiled, for with her brother she felt safe. Atman's expression never changed until the dance was over. Then he set the small, dark girl down on the platform and stood before his father, head bowed. The chief laid his hand on his son's head in approval. Atman swung around and faced his people while the smile that flashed from his face might have dazzled the moon itself. The drums and flutes began again to build up an air, and the people began again to sway in time with it. Atman, young, strong, tireless, leaped into the midst, leading the Atmunchi in a tribal dance until the whole clearing seethed with the joyous, ecstatic motion. Dawn was still far distant, and this was the night of the year when no one would sleep. Dawn was further off than the invaders creeping silently through the jungle, a hundred black men commanded by three whites. Stealthily, they surrounded the village, making sure that their line was within the piles of knives and spears that the Atmanchi had left. Dropping to their knees at a given signal, they held their guns, took aim, and waited, tense and silent, for another signal. One of the white men raised his arm, and a hundred muskets blazed into the night. The dancing people stopped and looked skyward. Then they fell to their knees, bewildered, fearful only of one thing, that they had offended the spirit of the night. The chief slumped forward. All the muskets but one had been aimed into the treetops. Atman rose to his feet and bounded across the clearing to kneel by his father. Then, in the strange and fearful stillness of the jungle night, he knew what had happened. He stood tall and held out his hands to the people, but no smile flashed from his lips. There was no time for the Atmunchi to acknowledge the gesture of their new chief. With cries and shouts, the slavers advanced on the village. Seeing them, the Atmunchi screamed wildly and ran across the clearing, trying to reach their chief, who stood above them in strength and power, symbolizing protection. But the slavers advanced among them, tossed the Atmunchi about like leaves in a wind. Seizing the strongest and tallest, they quickly clamped wrist and ankle shackles on them, thrusting aside the old men and women, the little children. A white man approached the platform where Atman was standing, his arm around Athman. The white man uttered a volley of words, sharp as the sound of the muskets had been in Atman's ear and less meaningful, but Atman would not lower himself to respond. When the slaver advanced in trying to separate the brother and sister, Atman's hold only tightened on the girl. The white man hesitated. He had seen fire flashing from the eyes of the tall black youth, and he was afraid. A second white man, fully armed, approached from one side, and seeing him, gave the slaver courage. Stepping forward, he seized Athman and hurled her to the ground. When Atman reached out to help her, the two whites secured his wrists with bamboo withes and threw him down to chain his ankles. He's a likely one, the slaver muttered, and should fetch a good price, but he's dangerous. Tighten those irons. Dawn came. 
the Atmunshi men and some of their women stood in a long line chained together in the clearing surrounded by conical huts. Those whom the slaver had not wanted cowered together, too stunned for any utterance. Commands were barked out that meant nothing to the Atmunshi. Then the crack of a lash started the long line moving slowly. Seeing them disappear into the jungle, the old men and women and the little children set up a low wailing. It was so soft at first that it was scarcely audible, but it grew in volume and intensity. Desolate, deprived of their youth, their strength, their leadership, what were a handful of old people and children to do in the jungle? The line filed slowly on as the best of the Atmunchi, with bowed heads and bowed shoulders, stumbled into the unknown. Only a youth at the end of the line still carried his head high. Past the raised platform they went, past the huddled form of a young girl, and only the sound of her weeping let him know that she was alive. Passing her, Atmund suddenly bent low and said something to her. Then he raised his head again. The slaver, bringing up the rear, came forward with his lash. Atman cringed as he felt it, but he uttered no sound, though for the rest of his life his back would bear the marks made on it by the white man's lash. Athman lifted her head and listened until she could no longer hear the dull thud of footsteps echoing on the jungle floor. She rose to her feet with difficulty, then holding her hands open and outspread, as was the custom of her tribe, she advanced slowly toward her people. Atman had reminded her that her birth had made her the servant of her people. He was still a prince, though chains bound him, and she was a princess. Neither one could escape the work they had been born to do. And we'll read chapter two next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Bye-bye.